Okay, good afternoon to everyone. I hope you can hear and see me uh, well. Welcome back uh, for to this uh, um, energy data and modeling program. Um, so, so for another lecture, today is webinar number five, uh, which topic is introduction to energy modeling. So you have been working with uh, my colleague Zakia from the statistics department till now. So uh, starting today, we will move from statistics to modeling. So my name is Darlene Deme. We already met at the launch event of this program. And as I introduced, that, uh, introduced you during that uh, launch, I will be uh, uh, leading this part. Uh, I'm an energy analyst and modeler here at the IEA. And uh, I work mainly on uh, um, the African continent, so uh, with the energy and modeling on, on the continent. So uh, I will continue just by showing, showing you again um, the agenda for our uh, training. So as I said, starting today, we will, we will um, move to the modeling part. There will be just an introductory uh, lecture. Then we will have um, the energy demand uh, modeling lecture, which is the second one, and we will focus on the building sector. Then we will have the third, which is focused on the power sector. We will move to the hydrocarbon supply. Uh, then we will have two lectures with partner organizations, which are Polimi, so Politecnico di Milano from Italy, and uh, um, the Imperial College from the United Kingdom. Then we will have a specific focus, um, yeah, specifically focused lecture on SDG 7.1, so access to clean cooking and electricity, so the universal access to uh, clean cooking and electricity. And uh, then we will have a lecture on solid biofuels estimation model. And then we will wrap up with uh, some quiz and closing uh, remarks. Just a little clarification uh, here you can see uh, but uh, I think my colleague Zaki already introduced you to, to that. As you, you know, this first part of our training program uh, is held uh, online. So uh, through this Zoom platform, um, I kindly invite you to, uh, whenever you have a question to or raise your hand so that I can give you the floor and you will be able to uh, unmute yourself and speak. So uh, let's say directly ask for your question. Otherwise, if you prefer, you can use the Q&A box and just um, leave there your question. And in specific Q&A uh, moment, I will answer, uh, answer your question. And yeah, we can start uh, maybe a debate depending on the kind of question you, you may ask. First of all, uh, again, I think you already had the opportunity to use this tool. I will be asking you to, um, whether it's your mobile, through your mobile phone or your laptop, to connect to the www.menti.com website for an online polling. We will do like an introductory one. Uh, and I will just, uh, let's say, ask you some, some very uh, basic questions just to start and to introduce you to the modeling um, approach. So we'll share the screen so, you, so that you can also see which are the questions. I will write in the chat the code that you can use. So this is the link that you can use. Oh, sorry, to share it with everyone. So this is the code, this is the link, and this is the code. Okay. Okay. So you should be able to log into uh, the mainte.com platform. Uh, and the first question I uh, I ask you is, um, what do you think energy models are useful for? So just feel free to write whatever you want. I just remind you that this uh, polling is completely anonymous, so I'm not able to see your who is answer is is answering what. So feel free to be 100% uh, free to exactly to um, to write whatever you want. So I see some one of, one of the participants already wrote prediction, which is a nice word. We will talk definitely about this subject, but here we can see that um, 
this colleague of us, which is which has wrote um, prediction, is let's say looking um, forward. It's, we're already thinking about the the future, and that's what characterized this part of the uh, training program. Because with my colleague Zakia, you you worked on statistics, so the idea is um, analyzing what has been the historical and what is let's say the uh, status quo today, but in the modeling part, we will be working more on, let's say, the future and trying to model what uh, the energy system, the global energy system, or maybe uh, country or continent at a con country or continental level, what will be, uh, let's say, the future. So we see again um, forecasting, projecting for for future. So again, uh, let's say future oriented answers we have keeping data and tariff settings also which are um, interesting interesting topics we will work um, on both forecasting demand estimation that's really really important especially we will see this um, in may, let's say all the the lectures also today we will we will have um, have an ex exercise on that uh, but we will all the all the lectures will have um, demand estimation uh, as a, a main topic because that's really important because when we plan, which is the uh, actual goal of modeling, um, one of the main goal of modeling, we will we have to to estimate which is the demand because otherwise uh, we we can't actually uh, estimate uh, we can actually uh, plan the future. So I will move with the following question. This question is, in your opinion, what are the main elements to uh, consider, so to take into account when developing an energy, an energy model? So you have five options and you can, for each of, of them, um, select between strongly uh, disagree and strongly agree. So you have an entire spectrum of options. The first answer is the model objective the quality of input data, predictable political trajectories, the assumptions, and the timeliness of input data. So, which means the latest year of available data. Okay, I see we have three three answers. Okay, five. Sorry, I have a. Chat for demand forecast. We use model for energy demand analysis. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Jovin. We will have the actually you anticipated one of the next questions, which is which kind of models do you use? So um, I will postpone uh, like debating on your comment in the chat uh, because I would like to have let's say the entire uh, spectrum of uh, tools that all of you are currently using, and then we can maybe in the future having have the possibility of talk. Uh, of talking about all uh, of each about each of uh, of these tools that you're using, so I see that I already have six answers. Uh, right now, we have the model objective and the timeliness of input data to be uh, considered that are considered the most important element right now. But the quality of input data is ranked third, and then we have assumptions and predictable pro political trajectories. So there is no, let's say, wrong right and good answer here because all of these are important but clearly some of them are more important when developing an energy model so i would say that more or less uh, the rankings that you gave uh, are representative of what is actually what we think at the iea are the main elements to consider when developing an energy model uh, but probably the quality of input data and the model objectives um, are the, the the more important one, the, the, you know, the most important one. Especially, you you will see also during the next lectures that 
first clearly the model objective you you can't develop a model without knowing what is your goal uh, while developing this model and this is let's say paramount but is also um i would say i would take that for granted because for any action you do you have to to have in mind what is the goal of that action but the quality of input data is really really important because the results of, of the results of our modeling ex exercises depend strongly strongly depend from the quality of the input data and that clearly also uh, is related to the last um, option which was the timeliness of the input data because if you have data which um, comes from 10 uh, 15 20 years ago uh, sometimes it's uh, it's a bit tricky to and yeah you can't expect the uh, output of your model for example to be uh, reliable and let's say uh, applicable to the current situation because sometimes for example I, I, this, an, is, an example is the uh, census so demographic data which are really important when you do energy modeling that sometime uh, I don't know in, um, in Rwanda with which let's say cycle they are done but sometimes they are done each 10 years and with the growth rate that we have in population in some countries in the world especially in the African continent you can imagine what the different you can you can have if using, for example, uh, population data from 2010 in 2019, so for example, nine years after the last uh, demographic uh, census. I will move with the next question, which is what is, in your opinion, the main driver of future energy demand trends? So you have five options, technology development, GDP, GDP growth, population growth, energy access, and low carbon energy policies. So you have uh, a little circle to uh, put in one of these five baskets. So I see population growth, GDP growth. Clearly, um, try to think about, uh, because really the, and I will be anticipating you uh, the answer again. Uh, these answers, like this question I'm asking you right now, um, when they don't specify, let's say, the area, like the region we are talking about, um, they tend to be, let's say, really generic because this question especially could be really, 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 like the answer to this question could be really different depending on the kind of country or region you are, uh, you are thinking about. Because, for example, I see that um, three of you, so the majority of you, uh, answered GDP growth. And GDP growth could be the answer probably if we think about, uh, let's say, uh, a European country. I come, uh, also, I come from, uh, like my mother come from, comes from, from Italy. And for Italy, GDP growth could be uh, the, the, the driver that uh, modelers in, uh, in, in Italy would use in order to predict the future energy demand in their country. But on the other hand, if we are talking about, for example, the, the African continent, uh, for example, my, my father was born in, uh, in, in Cameroon, um, I would expect other drivers to be used because uh, we know, and I anticipated also that in the previous question, that population growth is, um, is really different in the African continent with respect to, for example, the European continent, because in the European continent, we have, let's say, a pretty stable um, population over the years, whereas in the African continent, the vast majority of the countries have, let's say, very high population growth um, trends and rates. And on the other end, again, talking again uh, about the African continent, you uh, also would expect energy access. So more and more people um, get, uh, starting to have access to electricity, to energy, uh, being added, let's say, to the basket of people which currently already have uh, access to, the, to it. And in this way, the, let's say, country level energy demand uh, would really definitely grow uh, in, the, in the future. But again, uh, also technology development and low carbon energy policies are to drive it. So here again, there was no correct and uh, wrong answer. It really depends on the context, and uh, but clearly all of them, depending on the context, um, have really different uh, impacts and, and weights. 
Last question for this round, uh, which are, in your opinion, the most important variable to model uh, energy demand in passenger uh, road transport in a country? So again, as a second question, you have uh, a spectrum from strongly disagree to strongly uh, agree. And you have four options. So passenger kilometer, number of cars, average annual mile age or kilometer uh, per car, and the number of passengers per car. So which of these four you think are, is the most important variable to, um, so which are um, the plural since you are required to give an option, uh, an answer for all of the four options. Okay. All of four. Okay. I would be interested. As I, as I said, I don't know who is the person which answered one to all these four. So it means that uh, this person thinks that there are other variables to, take, to be taken into account, for example, uh, when modeling uh, energy demand in passenger road transport in a country. So if that person wants to write in the chat or to raise uh, their hand, and explain, uh, for example, which other variable, which other uh, parameter they would use to model energy demand in passenger road transport in a country. Uh, feel free to do that. I'm really curious because maybe we are missing some specific aspect that, for example, in a country as Rwanda could be different with respect to what we are used to do in modeling this specific sector uh, in other countries. So I see uh, the average annual mileage or kilometer per car, numbers of car, number of cars, passenger kilometer, and number of uh, passenger per car. Okay, so again, here all these uh, four parameters, uh, so sorry, variables are used in the modeling, at least here at DIA, when we model the passenger road transport in a country in terms of energy demand, future energy demand. Um, all of them are used in different ways, and you will see it uh, today because today's exercise is uh, is really related to to, to this question. Uh, numbers of so clearly, if you uh, all of them are really important because if you know how many cars, for example, on average, uh, sorry, how many people per car are on average in a country, you can see or you can say okay. We have less cars moving because, for example, uh, a lot of people use uh, shared transport. So you have the same uh, amount of people moving, but with less cars. And uh, this means less energy demand for that specific that sector. But clearly, also, it really depends on the average kilometers, for example, um, that uh, the average car um, uh, goes through in, in a year, etc. And clearly, the number of cars is really important because if you want to scale it to uh, the um, country level, you have to know how many count how many cars there are in the country. So, thank you for your answers. Uh, okay, I will I would skip this question, so don't answer right now. I will move uh, to the next uh, slide. So, this uh, today the topic today is. Um, is as I say, an introduction to the modeling, uh, to, to modeling. So today we, you will have this, at the end of this webinar, you will know, let's say more about these four uh, points. So the first is general principles in um, energy modeling and the building sector, in part, uh, building scenarios, sorry, and demand modeling. Then we will look at, uh, at the, let's say other, other aspects. So I will move with, Sorry, the uh, sharing of this next part. Okay, so stop
In this section, we will discuss some general principles on energy modeling and on how to build scenarios. So, as we all know, the energy sector uh, is at the heart of our societies and it is very linked to our climate and to our environment. There is no energy island, which means that what will happen in one country matters for the rest of the world and what will happen in one sector has impact in uh, other sectors. Stakeholders in the energy space are interested in understanding better the trends and the potential futures, but also to understand the possible technologies and fuel options, uh, which each have advantages and disadvantages. So how can energy modeling and energy scenario help? Well, first, they can uh, bring an integrated uh, view of different key driving forces in a holistic, consistent, and disciplined way. So again, energy modeling and scenario enable to explore alternative futures and deal with uncertainties, for example, providing uh, sensitivities analysis. And third, uh, modeling and scenario help understanding how different technological options can meet the requirements. There is no ideal model. A model is a tool which is built to answer a specific answer. So each model has strengths and weaknesses. At the IEA, our models are deeply rooted into techno-economic assessment, and we will present in the coming slides more details on our energy models. We need to, to define uh, our approach uh, to, towards the future and to discuss a bit terminology. So when we consider the future, we can try to predict what will happen in any case, but this is about prophecy. What we, what we do under energy modeling is to try to predict what happens if some conditions are met, and then we are exploring scenario, we are forecasting and foreseeing, but we can also try to investigate what should happen for a certain objective to be met. For example, if we want universal access to clean cooking and electricity to be reached by 2030, what would be the optimum uh, trajectory by, by that date? When we design energy uh, models, uh, we need first to ask ourselves what is the objective of this model? What is its scope and what will be its different features? And as a start, looking at historical data is fundamental because the level of details available will define how reliable and accurate the, the model will be. Then there are questions on coverage, what sector, what geographical areas, what type of fuels we want to take into account in the energy model. In terms of approach and techniques, there are different. We will present them in the coming slides. We can also integrate specific features like endogenous technological learning, where, for example, we will say that the cost of a given technology, for example, solar PV, would decrease over time as the deployment of this technology uh, increases. We can also include macroeconomic feedback, for example, in um, an oil producer country. If we take assumptions on the exports of oil, this might have impact on the GDP of the country. And GDP is usually an input information, as we will discuss later on. So this can impact the entire energy model. But the design of the model will uh, very much rely on drawing a line between what is exogenous and what is endogenous. And we will never insist uh, enough on that. Data requirements will totally um, depend on the model design and will, will strongly impact the, the model. We cannot do projection, we cannot look at the future if we don't have statistics and data that enable us to understand the present and to understand the past and where we come from. How can we make projections on the future of energy demand? There are two main methodologies, and the first approach is on end use. It's a bottom-up or an engineering approach. Here, the idea is to uh, use a physical relationship between energy 
and the end use devices, the processes, the services. Let's take an example. If we want to estimate what will be the demand for electricity in uh, the residential sector in 10 years, we could disaggregate the residential sector, look at each and every need household would have. For example, there is a need for lighting, for cooking, for uh, powering some appliances. So we would look sector by sector, what are the needs, what is the final energy demand, what are the devices that will provide those services. So there would be different type of lighting bulbs, LEDs, what will be the consumption of each of those devices, and we will be able to get um, a number of the electricity demand for this sector. So this approach is, um, is highly disaggregated and it enables very precise analysis. Although it's complex and data consuming, it is very appropriate for the midterm and the long term. Another approach for estimating future energy demand is to uh, look at econometric uh, established relations, for example, between energy demand and economic variables. Again, if we want to estimate the future electricity demand in the residential sector, we could try to look what is the level today and to see how it's, uh, how it's linked to the GDP per capita. And if we look at the evolution of the GDP per capita, we could try to estimate what will be the evolution of electricity demand. And this will be based on established relationships between those two variables based in the past, based in other regions and comparable countries. So this type of approach uh, is made at a very aggregated level. It's not made at the end use level, so it's simpler but it is less accurate. This approach is very appropriate for the short term. When we want to project and to estimate what the future of energy supply could be, again, there are two methodologies. The first one is about optimization. We ensure minimizing a variable uh, under like cost and ensuring that uh, it meets all the constraints. So it can be uh, having a level of electricity produced at the lower cost, having an electricity mix at the lower emission factor. Another methodology is about simulation, where we will simulate behaviors of both energy consumers and energy producers. For example, we will take one signal that would be price, price of the oil barrel, and see, depending on the price, how much oil consumer will ask for and how much oil producer would be able to bring to the market. And then you do iterations to find an equilibrium between uh, consumption and production. On this slide, we are trying to, to recap a mapping of those different energy models and approaches. So as we said, you can be under a deductive approach and do some forecasting. So what the future is likely to look like given a set of assumptions. So if we have these policies, if we continue with um, this type of technology, what would the future look like? And on the right end of the slide, you can see another approach, which is strategic planning. So this is a normative um, methodology where we will set an objective, universal access to electricity, reduction of uh, CO2 emissions as per our climate agreement. And we will try to deduct and, um, and backcast what would be the pathway to get there. Then in terms of modeling methodology, as we say, there are bottom-up methodologies and top-down. There are many different models and existing tools to do energy modeling. At the IEA, we use what we call the World Energy Model that we will present in, um, in two more details. Energy modeling relies on scenario. And to build a scenario, it is needed to develop sets of policies that will describe different future pathways. Creating a coherent storyline among policy, prices, deployment, and development of energy sources and technologies are important 
and it is needed to ensure that all that makes sense together. At the International Energy Agency, the flagship publication World Energy Outlook relies on two main scenarios. The first one is the stated policy scenario, or steps, which holds up a mirror to the actions and the intentions of today's policymakers. In other words, it is a deductive approach where we provide a candid assessment of what would happen if those policy actions and intentions are implemented and what will be the implication for energy markets, for energy security, for emissions. Another scenario, which comes from a normative approach, is the sustainable development scenario. It provides a strategic pathway to meet global climate goals, air quality, and energy access in full. So here the idea is to say what shall be the pathway if we want to have universal access by 2030, if we want to be aligned with our climate and air quality goals. But we can also develop ad hoc analyses, cases, sensitivities. And in the case of Africa, in 2019, the World Energy Outlook presented the Africa case, which uh, includes as targets the Agenda 2063 of Africa Union goals for inclusive and sustainable socioeconomic growth, in addition to universal access to both electricity and clean cooking and to improvement of air quality. This is a simplified chart of the International Energy Agency World Energy Model, or WEM, and we will come to this slide uh, many times in the coming sessions and the coming trainings. You can see on the top part of the chart some green arrows, which are the input assumptions. On the bottom part, you have the output uh, with orange arrows, including energy flows, so the energy balances, associated CO2 emissions and investment required to have those energy systems. And the heart of the modeling, um, of the energy modeling tool itself is broken down into um, different subsections. So going from the right to the left, on the right, we have the final energy demand sectors, industry, transport, buildings, agriculture, and we will look at the services uh, which require energy and the end use demand. Left to that, we will deduct the transformation processes, refinery, power sector, and the primary energy demand uh, related to that. So oil, mm, oil demand, coal, gas, but also resources for power generation. On the top left side, you have the supply um, modeling section with fossil fuel supply, but very importantly as well, trade matrices, import, export of oil, of gas, as well as domestic production. And the fossil fuel prices will play a role of equilibrium between supply and demand. Developing models requires to take assumptions. And at the IEA, our modeling ex uh, exercises rely on various sets of, of data, including IEA internal statistics and research, as well as external um, data available. When it comes to cost, it is very important to have regular peer review of the hypothesis because uh, cost can evolve very, very quickly and be outdated uh, very, very quickly. At the IEA, all our main assumptions are made publicly available and transparent in our website and in our publication. And what ensures the robustness and the seriousness of our work is that each and every report is peer reviewed by many experts from different sectors, from different um, sources and uh, regions. In the model, uh, the input uh, is, uh, includes exogenous uh, assumptions. And those assumptions are related to socioeconomic drivers, like how population will evolve in the future, how GDP is to, to evolve. So we can rely on other uh, institutions' predictions, like IMF, or make our own predictions. Then we will take as exogenous assumption the policies that government would take, for example, energy policies 
in uh, the renewable um, space with targets that could be fixed by, by government, with standards that could be implemented or support measure to, um, to certain um, energy um, technologies, energy access targets, subsidies, uh, removal rates, that will also uh, help uh, the assumption and uh, be input to the model. Technology assumptions are key as well, including investment, efficiency of the technology, cost of the capital for deploying those technologies, as well as assumptions on infrastructure development. How long does it take to develop uh, hydropower dam, for example? In this section, we will present energy demand modeling, starting with general principles and then illustrating with industry, transport, and building sectors. Coming back to our simplified chart of the world energy model, we are on the right part, so looking at final energy demand that will enable us to understand transformation processes in the second, uh, in the second step. So, what do we want to do in the demand side uh, modeling models of the world energy outlook? We are uh, building on a bottom-up modeling of the energy sector, and this is done for 25 regions of the, of the world, encompassing power, heat, and other transformation, and looking at the final uh, sectors, which are industry, transport, buildings, and others. The objective is to get an explicit uh, idea of the sector and the technology-specific parameters, which would be specific to each region and country as well. We want to know about stocks of equipments, future capacities and future sales of such equipment, lifetime of each, um, each unity, each uh, equipment, cost and related efficiencies. And this applies to the car fleet in a country, but also to the power plant, where we'd like to understand, again, stock, future capacity, uh, and features of each of those plants. Each and every module of the demand uh, modeling are structured in the same way. The question we want to answer is, what will be the final energy demand coming from transport, from industry, from agriculture? And to answer this question, we need to ask ourselves, what is the real demand for energy services? So what is the, the requested useful energy? And what will be the technologies, the fuels, the equipment that will meet this, uh, that will provide these uh, services? Sometimes it's not easy to have estimation of how the demand for energy services will evolve, so we need to define some drivers to make those estimations. So let's take an example on a residential sector. If we want to estimate how the demand for electricity in the residential sector will evolve, we can look at one specific topic that would be lighting. And the question is, how will households want to uh, get lighting services in the future? We may know what is the demand today for electricity, for lighting houses, but we don't know very well how this will evolve. So we can try, based on econometric analysis, to estimate this. And a driver that could be a good indication of lighting services could be the the squared meters per capita. And here, again, based on econometric analysis, we can try to project how the, the squared meter per capita will evolve in a certain country, maybe function of the GDP per capita. And assuming that we know how the GDP per capita is projected to evolve based on uh, projections from um, socioeconomic uh, analysis, we can estimate how the squared meter per capita will evolve, and then based on what we observed in the past, what we observe in similar countries, we can estimate how the demand for lighting will evolve for all those, um, those houses, for all those meters per, per capita. 
From there, we'll be able to anticipate how demand for lighting will increase and to understand what is the part of this demand which is provided by existing technologies, how those technologies, how those equipments like the, the existing light bulbs will, um, will last and uh, there will be a, a retirement of those old technologies. So if we want to meet the new demand, we have a need for new equipments. And based on a cost-based approach, we will be um, we'll be estimating what type of technology will be deployed. For example, for the lighting need, we could have super efficient LED as well as more basic light bulbs. And based on um, economic uh, analysis, we can estimate what will be the share of super efficient LED that will be bought by people and what will be the share of more basic lighting bulbs. Each of those technologies, so this diverse portfolio of technology uh, has for each different efficiency levels. So we will be able to uh, convert this uh, need for useful energy into a need for final energy based on the efficiency of each equipment. Different strategies uh, will, um, will be implied for different sectors. Here, if we look at the sustainable development scenario, we can see how total final consumption would evolve by sector and by fuel. And we can see that in the transport sector, there is a sharp decline in the total final consumption that also leads to a decline in the CO2 emissions. But we don't have such um, evolution in industry and, and buildings. One reason that would be that uh, due to the expansion of electricity access, the total final consumption in building is not, um, is not decreasing. So in each uh, end use sector module, the questions we want to answer is, what will be the need for new equipments in the future? And this requires to ask the first question, which is, what is the end use de demand in the future? Then how much equipment needs to be replaced? How much new equipment we will need? And to, to do that, we, we are asking ourselves, which are the technologies chosen to meet the estimated uh, end use demand? And what is the influence of energy policies? In our case of lighting, we could try to estimate what if the government uh, puts standards which provide from importing very basic lighting bulbs, but really supports the deployment of super efficient LED. This would have an impact in our exercise of allocating the different technologies to uh, meet the end use needs. And Another question we want to answer is what will be the associated in the resulting um, final energy demand and the associated CO2 emissions and investment. Now we will very quickly illustrate uh, this on the industry sector. So the industry demand module is disaggregated per sector. So we will have different industrial sector aluminium, cement, etc. And in our model, we will, as usual, um, have as inputs socioeconomic um, drivers like GDP, population, but also historic production of industry products and end use energy prices. In terms of activity variable, we will take into consideration physical production. So if we want to estimate the future an energy demand from the cement industry, we might take as a variable the tons of cement which uh, will be produced in the future and deduct from the tons of cement what would be the uh, energy demand. For some sectors where we don't have a physical production, we can look at the value added of this specific uh, industry. This is an example of results that we, we can get in our analysis, looking at Africa industry. Here you can see four countries uh, with 
2018 levels of uh, demand on cement and on steel in 2018 and in 2040, according to our projections. And we have also compared these levels to those of India in, in 2018. So steel and cement demand per capita is one example of parameter we will uh, project so that we get a better understanding of what could be the total energy demand coming from, from the industry. And the interesting part of the analysis is that we are able also to uh, look at what would be the share of imports and the share of domestic production. Another analysis uh, that we are bringing to your attention in the industry sector is about motors, because most of the energy demand in the uh, in the industry sector comes from motor driven system and this is where efficiency matters a lot because there is a high potential with efficiency measures to decrease the energy demand in the industry sector looking at the efficiency of motors moving to the transport sector so when it comes to transport we again need to disaggregate so we know that there is transport on roads aviation rail navigation so this will be our disaggregated subsectors and we will look for activity variables that will depend on whether we're looking at passengers or goods as usual we have social um, economic um, indicators as input of the model including population gdp and historical data so as discussed, the activity variable we will rely on are passenger kilometers, which is basically an aggregated indicator of vehicle fleet, distance traveled on average by one car, and occupation rates of number of people in one car. And this number will be uh, a good indication of the intensity of um, how much people want to travel uh, on the road with cars. We will have the same type, type of indicator with goods on ton kilometers, where we will multiply vehicle fleet by distance uh, traveled by load factor or quantity of good uh, in, um, in the trucks. Again, if we look at one analysis we have done on the future of Africa transport, we can, um, we can focus on evolution of vehicle ownership. And here we have made projections on the level of cars and two and three wheelers uh, owned by thousands of people in Africa. The key message is that it is, um, it is expected to grow very fast, to grow further in the Africa case scenario. And you, you have countries uh, like Ghana, where the number of two and three readers per thousand people is expected to triple. We also need to remember that this is per thousand people and the population itself will grow. So there is uh, expectation of much more cars, much more two, three readers in the roads in Africa in the coming decades. And the results of our outlook exercise on the Africa transport is based on evolution of the car fleet, based on evolution of passenger uh, kilometers indicators, of ton kilometers indicators, we can have an estimation on how total energy demand for the transport sector would evolve. So starting in 2018, we see that there is a breakdown where road passenger makes the bulk of the energy demand. By 2030, this is uh, expected to grow and the difference between our stated policy scenario and the Africa case is due to a higher GDP that means uh, more economic development, more cars in the roads, more trucks in the roads. Looking ahead to 2040, we can see that uh, higher GDP again uh, increases the demand for transport, but efficiency gain contributes to limit the growth. So again, there is a strong case for efficiency measures that can uh, limit the growth of uh, economic uh, of um, energy demand. 
looking now at the building sector. So services sector, where again, we will have to segment and disaggregate by the type of engine need we are looking at. So we know that in buildings, we are looking for space cooling, water heating, we are looking for energy for cooking, for lighting, for powering appliances. Here, the activity variables we will look at are floor space, so squared meter per capita, number of households, appliances ownership, how many uh, TV or how many phones does um, a household have on average, and we can also rely on services added value. As usual, our input data will be socioeconomic drivers, but also building specific indicators like urbanization or dwelling occupancy. One, one result at a global level is that under the stated policy scenario, we see that there would be an increase of almost all fuels to meet the needs in buildings because buildings are requiring electricity for lighting, for example, but also oil products, LPG for cooking, for instance, but it can also be heat, gas for cooking, etc. We can see that this is a totally different story if we are under our sustainable development scenario at the global level, where uh, CO2 emissions coming from the building sector are expected to decrease, and we will see an increasing share of electricity uh, as uh, the main fuel uh, providing the energy services for the building sector. One, uh, one key analysis specific to Africa about cooling. As you, as you may know, today there are 700 million people who need cooling services in Africa today because they live in places where the average temperature every day does never go below 25 degrees. In 2040, this number will rise to 1.2 billion because of population growth and because of global warming. Today, the equipment in air conditioner, fans, is very low, but with uh, middle class rising and with population growth and urbanization, we expect that the demand for cooling services would increase a lot by 2040, and this will translate into a demand for electricity in the building sector. Still, if some efficiency measures are implemented, there is a potential to um, divide by two this uh, increase in the electricity demand, for example, implementing standards to import the most advanced um, air conditioner and the most efficient fans. Okay, perfect. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Hear me. Uh, I hope you, everything was clear. So, as I said, um, this this part was let's say covering the general principles on energy modeling, buildings, and building scenarios. Um, so now I would move on with uh, just a, a quick analysis I wanted to show you because it's really uh, let's say the core of what we do uh, here at the IEA. Here uh, you have uh, this figure, this chart that I already anticipated you in the pre-launch event of our uh, of this program so here you can see and this comes from the africa energy outlook uh, that we published in 2019 uh, which was the version of our let's say we have uh, the world energy outlook that i assume all of you knows which is our flagship publication which is published every year and which analyzes, let's say the uh, global energy systems to the entire world but in 2019, for the first time, we published we published an African Energy Outlook, which was actually the let's say the continental version of the World Energy Outlook. This year, so 2022, we will also uh, again publishing a new African Energy Outlook, uh, which will uh, let's say start from the uh, analysis we did 
in 2019. But as you may imagine, since in these three years, we had uh, really unprecedented events like the COVID-19 crisis. And now we also have the Ukrainian-Russian conflict. Um, we will try to do uh, like new analysis. Um, and I, I really invite you, we will be publishing uh, this document probably at the um, in June or July, but for sure this year. So uh, I really invite you first, if you if you want, right now to start looking at the uh, 2019 version, and then uh, when we will be publishing the new one, I will uh, also inform you. So here you can see um, one of the analysis. This comes from the regional analysis, so on the sub-Saharan Africa. And this is the primary energy demand and GDP um, GDP analysis. If you remember, uh, in the uh, pre-launch um, pre-launch uh, uh, event, I anticipated you, but I am pretty sure that also my colleague Zakia during the statistics uh, lectures uh, already explained to you which are uh, one of the scenarios, like which are the scenarios that we are developing here at the IEA. Uh, they have specific names and they have specific assumptions behind them. So here presented, you have two of them. One, in, which is the standard one, let's say the, the one which we, we we used to apply is called stated policies scenario. And it's called like that because it's, it's, um, it's a, a scenario that, that take, takes into account all the policies that are currently um, let's say published by all the uh, governments in the world. So we use those information contained in all, in all the policies um, published by these, uh, by, these uh, by all the world governments. And we use them as assumptions and as inputs for our modeling exercises. And this means that um, like the idea, the assumption is that by, for example, in this case, 2040, which is the uh, time horizon taken into account for this chart, uh, all the policies that all the countries in the world, and in this case in Sub-Saharan Africa, has committed to um, be, let's say, uh, compliant with, will actually um, be uh, achieved. And the difference between, for example, the chart on the left, which, uh, as I said, is for the stated policy scenario, uh, is that the Africa case is a new case which was uh, explicitly developed for the um, 2019 Africa Energy Outlook, and is a scenario which takes into account what, um, like the Agenda 2063, that I hope all of you know, but if you don't know, is like is uh, um, let's say uh, the regional strategy, um, which has been um, developed by all the countries in the continent uh, through the African. Uh, commission and the idea uh, is like like the goal of this um, this Africa sorry sorry this agenda 2063 is to uh, drive uh, policy uh, implementation in order to have a prosperous Africa um, let's say based on inclusive growth and sustainable development so here you can see the differences so you have the first on both graphs you have 2010 and 2018 values, which are the same, because here we are talking about um, historic uh, data. Uh, but the 2030 and 2040 are really different because they are the result of modeling of uh, with different assumptions uh, of the future. So here you can see how uh, there is draft, drastic. So first of all, the um, energy, the primary energy demand is. Uh, is growing in both cases. So you can see uh, how in the case, for example, uh, of um, the stated policy scenario, we have the bioenergy uh, part, which is uh, increasing a lot, but in general, all the primary energy demand is increasing both in 2030 and in 2040. And we can see, let's say, a uh, uh, trend because they are actually growing going from more for more or less uh, 500 mega TOE to uh, less than uh, 900 mega TOE. In the Africa case, um, and also you can see that the uh, orange, I think it's the orange dot, is the GDP growth. So you can see, sorry, I see I have a question in the QA. Okay, sorry, I will go back to uh, Sila's question in a moment. 
Um, as I said, um, you have in orange the GDP. So you can see that uh, there is, let's say, a cons consistency between the growth in the GDP and the uh, primary energy demand in the left chart. But if you look at the right chart, uh, we have the Africa case in which the GDP is increasing even more with respect to the stated policy. So the Africa case actually has, um, let's say, as strategic. The, the goal of the Africa case is pushing the development of the sub-Saharan Africa region even more than uh, what are, let's say, the currently uh, in place policies. So, but in this case, if you if you see, it it seems to be a paradox because we can see that, um, for example, in the Africa case, the GDP is growing even more, but the primary energy demand seems to be less uh, with respect to uh, the estimation through. Uh, done through the stated policy scenario. And this is basically because of two things. The first thing is the fact that, uh, oh, sorry, I forgot one thing, and the fact that the Africa case uh, as, as one of the, uh, let's say the goal to the uh, universal access to electricity. So this is really important because if you remember in the question I asked you for the, um, in the Menti, um, Menti poll, energy access is, is one of the main drivers of the uh, primary energy demand growth because we are uh, talking about more and more million, uh, million and million of people uh, gradually uh, gaining access to electricity and to energy. Um, so in this case, you can see that um, the primary energy demand, even though we have GDP uh, growth higher uh, on higher, higher higher rate, is less. This is because of two. Um, two main aspects. The first is the drastic efficiency improvement that are taken into account in the Africa case. And the second one is the accelerated move uh, away from solid biomass um, that I, I think you all know that bioenergy is um, by far, and you can see it from these charts, um, the, um, let's say the, uh, the main source in terms of primary energy demand uh, all over Africa. So the idea uh, here is to move away from, um, from this, uh, this fuel, so from bioenergy to more efficient, um, more efficient sources. So you can see also not necessarily looking at the total chart, but also looking at the colors, how the different sources are um, moving and changing uh, during the years. Uh, okay, so we'll move on. Okay, uh, just a, to know if you have questions, but actually I would move with the uh, Mentimeter. So I would ask you again to connect to Mentimeter, to menti.com and with the same link you can find in the chat. And I will postpone after that the, uh, the Q&A session so that maybe some question, because some the question I see is related to one of the questions I will be asking you in the in the Mentimeter, in the Menti tool. So you should be able to see my screen right now. And the question uh, I'm asking you right now is which modeling or projection tools have you been using, if any? So some of you already answered. We have two people which answered Excel and uh, one which um, answered MAED. Okay, so I see most of you are really using Microsoft Excel, uh, which is uh, which is very good because this is the tool we'll be using at least in this first part of our uh, modeling um, modeling webinars. Also today we will have an exercise in Excel in Microsoft Excel. So this is good that all of you uh, are quite familiar with this tool. I see another tool which is. DMID, which is the model for analysis in energy demand, which has been developed by our colleagues in the International Atomic Energy Agency. So uh, this is also good. And this is a really uh, specific tool, like context-specific tool. Uh, it's really like, 
oriented to the uh, estimation and modeling of analysis of uh, the energy demand and i take this opportunity to yeah 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 actually uh, yeah yeah thank you for thank you jovin for pointing out that yeah yeah that that's what um, that's why i was uh, saying that uh, all of you knows excel because actually maed mid is also excel based absolutely um so i will take uh, the opportunity to answer the question I had in the Q&A box from Silas, which is what is the appropriate model um, to be used in the energy sector? So actually, since uh, you are talking about the energy sector, uh, there is no appropriate model, let's say. It's, it really depends on what you are trying to, uh, to do. Uh, what's your, for example, in which institution you work, um, which uh, is, let's say, the, your, your work and what you're asked, let's say, from a decision maker to, to, to do as, uh, as analysis. So um, during these, um, these webinars, we will be seeing a lot of, uh, like we will be working in Excel, but we will be developing really different models, uh, one from the other, because all of them have a specific uh, goals. So, for example, today we will be working uh, with a really simple model on front non transport sector. Tomorrow, uh, not sorry, in the next lecture, you will see um, uh, an exercise which is um, looking at the, the energy demand in the uh, residential sector. We will work especially on the cooling um, needs for the residential sector. Then you will have another uh, exercise which is. Uh, related to the power sector. And um, the last one is uh, really related to uh, the hydrocarbon supply modeling. So really, it really depends on the, uh, on the kind of, of work you're supposed to do in your specific role. So um, if, for example, uh, you want, uh, jo um, sorry, I forgot from whom, okay, Silas, um, to tell me which is uh, the the sector you work you work in or which kind of modeling you uh, could be interesting in developing or you are currently do doing I don't know uh, we can uh, think about uh, together what could be the kind of model you you should be using or which which we which kind of modeling we can advise you to to look at at least in terms of uh, approach and assumption and now the calculations and the modeling are done but uh, the right answer here is that there is no let's say right or wrong model, probably there is, um, like there is not an absolutely uh, right model, but the idea is uh, based on the context to um, develop different models. All of them has a specific question they are supposed to uh, give an answer to. So we'll move to the next question. So when working on projecting, estimating future trends, which time horizon do you usually consider? So this is, again, uh, really, uh, there is, uh, it's an open question to you because I was curious to understand, uh, as I ask, ask you, which modeling tool you, you, tools you use. Um, here, I would like to, to ask you, uh, when you do projection and estimations, uh, which time horizon are you are used to, to consider? So. Is it like very short term, like five years, less than five years, or between five and 10, 10 to 20, or even like really long term projections, uh, for example, more than 20 years? So, just to uh, give some benchmarks, now we are in 2022. So, if we do like to 2030, 2040, we are thinking about really like 10 to 20, or even more than 20 years. So, right now I see quite, let's say, uh, uniform. So we have two people, three people working in very short term um, projection and estimations. We have one person which is actually very uh, working on very long uh, projections and estimation. And we have one person between 10 and 20. So there is no specific question, uh, let's say, already uh, prepared on mentee. But I would ask those people, uh, for example, um, at least one person uh, which is working on less than five years and also uh, the person which is working on more than 20 years if you may raise your hand or uh, write in the chat because i would i would be really curious to 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 hear a bit a bit about uh, your work which is for which institution you work etc if you want to share it with uh, with me and uh, 
uh, your colleagues here in the in the webinar. I think the best way would be to give you the floor if you if you want. So just raise your hand and I can give you the floor. Otherwise, just write it in the chat. In the meantime, I will be trying to uh, find the other second part of today's lecture. In this section. Okay, I don't see any raised hand or uh, comment in the chat. So I will go back briefly to uh, the PowerPoint. So if you have any question, just ask me, uh, raise your hand again, if, in, if it's a comment, uh, whatever, whatever you, you would like to share with us or to ask or to put on the table. I don't know if uh, Mr. Nkurunziza, if I uh, answered your question with respect to the uh, appropriate model used in the energy sector. So again, if if I answered, feel free to, to write it just so that I, I know that. Okay. Okay, I see, I see. Okay, uh, one, we have a question on electricity demand. Any other? Any other question? I prefer to gather all of them and then answer in a... Okay, so uh, I will postpone answering to your question just because uh, I prefer to, uh, let's say, to gather if there are also other questions. And once we are done with the second part of the, of the lecture, I will answer you, okay? So just give me a second to share the video and then I can move. We will present the energy modeling for the power sector and the refineries, so for transformation processes. In our world energy model simplified charts, so we are at the central part looking at transformation for power generation, which is often associated with heat production, and looking at refinery. Power sector is very complex and we will present more into details this slide uh, in a dedicated sessions on modeling of power sector but the two main questions we want to answer looking at the future of the power sector is what will be the new plants we need to add and this is based on the existing stock of uh, power plants and how they will evolve when they will be uh, retired and with the increase of the demand, so based on investment assumptions, on refurbishment of existing plants, we will be able to, to estimate what will be the need for new plants to be added. And the second quick key question we, we need to ask is, what will be the merit order dispatch? So in other words, uh, how we will be able to meet at each, um, each second energy demand and to have a match between electricity demand and electricity supply by operating the right plants in, an, in a power mix where we would have solar PV producing during the day and base load uh, power plants that would, um, that would be um, also available in the day, but also at the peak of the demand in the night. The question is, when do we need to give priority to this or that technology based on different factors that would be uh, cost, that would be CO2, etc. When it comes to integrating renewables into the electricity mix, uh, there is uh, some modeling to be done as well, looking at the potential of uh, renewable energies, solar PV, wind, etc and looking at the, at the cost as well. So this will enable us to uh, have a calculation on deployment of renewable energy and to estimate the needs for investment. What we observe is that 
decreasing, decreasing cost and policy support are really bringing down the, the, the cost of uh, renewables and are really bringing um, higher and higher the shares of renewable in most countries with important competitiveness. Let's have a look at one result of our modeling exercise on the African power sector, where on the left part you can see demand for electricity in Africa, and on the right part you can see how this demand is, uh, is supplied, is provided by the electricity generation sources. So today, most of the electricity demanded in Africa is for productive uses, industry, agriculture, uh, and there is also a significant part for households, and it's uh, provided by, um, by sources which are gas, solar PV, hydro, and other, uh, other sources for electricity generation. Based on our modeling, which comes from the demand sector, so how we evolve the demand in the building sector, in the industry uh, sector, in, in the transport sector, we will have estimation of the future need for electricity. And here you can see that uh, there is an important increase of productive electricity for productive uses for households which are already connected to the electricity today and that will have more appliances or more electricity needs. But also there will be a new demand from households who are not connected today and who will gain access to electricity. And the mix for uh, generating this electricity will also evolve with uh, an important role for gas, but the big winners will be modern renewables, specifically solar PV, who is expected to grow uh, very fast. Another module into the transformation um, step of our world energy model is the refining model. And this model is really the link between oil demand so, for example, demand for oil products uh, in transport, gasoline, um, diesel, other LPG and other products, and oil supply that will be crude oil, and refining is the intermediate between the two. So, uh, we will have to, to look, uh, as we always do, at the demand category of product per category, kerosene, LPG, uh, gasoline, etc. We will have to look at the demand for refined product, how those refineries are uh, operated, what are the runs of those refineries, and then as uh, there is a lot of trade uh, for oil uh, products and for crude oil, we will have to balance um, region per region how the, um, the exchanges will happen between um, local and domestic production, import, exports, from different regions. So if you try to look at what uh, the results of our outlook would be for the oil sector, we can see that we expect oil production, so crude oil production in Africa to be stable, while demand for oil, which derives from demand from uh, oil products, uh, is expected to, to increase. So. Considering the, re the evolution of refinery runs, so how much crude oil will be um, converted into oil products, we can deduct what will be the, the expected net product impulse, and this give, gives a very good indication of dependency on imports. In this section, we will describe energy modeling for the supply side. Coming back to our simplified chart of the world energy model, we are now looking at the left part, the supply of energy model. And we will see that fossil fuel prices have a key role. So the fossil fuel supply models are typically uh, containing three models, oil, natural gas, and coal, even though oil and gas model are interlinked via natural gas liquids. The oil supply model is uh, at a global level uh, where supply and demand are in balance, whereas natural gas and coal, which are usually more domestically or regionally traded energies, are considered at regional, um, at regional level. For in the case of natural gas, 
there are some uh, infrastructure which are like pipelines that determine where a certain production will be uh, consumed. But we observe with um, NG that natural gas is increasingly a global resource. To run those fossil fuel uh, supply modules, there are many iterations between supply and demand and price play a key role. And um, as you will see, there are different typologies and types of oil and gas. So prices play a key role of equilibrium in the world energy model because it is based on the idea that fossil fuel prices uh, reflect levels which are sufficient for investment, but also to meet demand. So prices are at a level that, um, that makes that consumers can afford getting those uh, resources, but at a level which is high enough that producer, so countries, companies, and investors can actually produce this resource and, um, and uh, have uh, economic return on their investment. So in this exercise, prices are derived through iterative uh, modeling and their trajectories are smooth and linear, even though we know that in reality, prices of oil, for example, are very, very volatile. We could have a more volatile and more um, and a less smooth trajectory, but this is not the goal of this modeling exercise where we want to have long-term trajectories. So for example, if we look at uh, different projections of the price of crude oil, uh, we see that under current policy or stated policy scenario, there is an increase of, um, the, of oil barrel. And the main idea is that under the scenario, demand for oil is expected to grow. So the resources to be developed will be uh, more and more costly. So this will be reflected in the price uh, proposed by um, producers to uh, consumers. In the case of the sustainable development scenario, we expect a decrease in demand for oil products. So um, there is also um, derived from that an expectation that the cost of production of the resource developed will be the, lower, uh, the lowest one. And on average, the crude oil price is expected to, to decline. One key uh, specificity to the to the oil and gas sector is that uh, contrary to the power sector, you cannot uh, switch on and switch off uh, plant upon request. When you have an existing uh, field producing uh, oil or producing gas, this specific field has a profile of production. And if we look today at how the supply and the production of oil meets the demand and if we look in the future we can see that under our stated policy demand scenario we expect uh, demand for oil to increase slightly or remain stable but the existing production of um, fields which are exploited today is to decrease naturally so if we want to uh, fill the to fill the gap and to continue meeting the demand we need to invest in new fields. So one new investment will bring to the market additional resource, but this field will decrease over time. And this will be the case for all new fields. So there is a need to invest um, and to, to invest um, continuously to ensure that there is a match between demand and existing production. So there are calculations which are made at regional um, level to, uh, to ensure that there is a match between demand for uh, crude oil, refining capacity, and uh, demand for, um, for oil products. Looking at one uh, key output for Africa, here you can see the net income that can be made from oil and gas resources in the top 10 producers in the continent. 
what is um, what is striking is that there is there has been a high volatility of incomes over the last two decades. And if you link this to government expenditure, you can see that when the prices, when the revenues went up, government expenditure went up at a rapid pace. But in case of uh, of um, decrease, it was more difficult for governments to decrease their um, expenditure. What can the future look like? So again, we need to, to make assumptions to make different scenario. Under a stated policy scenario we did last year, we would expect um, to see, uh, based on the prices and the levels of production, that um, the top 10 producers in Africa could go back to um, levels of revenues which are the average of the last decade. But under another scenario of faster energy transition, there would be less demand for oil and gas products, and then there, there might be less revenues for um, the, the key producers. To conclude, energy models are a framework which um, provide or enable analysis, but it is a simplified representation of the real world. And the level of, of detail, the level of uh, accuracy of the model will depend on what question we want to answer and what are the data available. Energy systems modeling provide uh, many inputs. It can provide an outline for different possible directions where the energy system would go depending on assumptions. It gives uh, high level examples of prices, consumption, emissions, and it can give to policymaker cost estimates. But it is a long-term and a continuous process. It involves expertise from many different uh, disciplines, and it's mostly a framework to help think about the challenges which are faced by energy systems and the decisions that needs to be taken by policymaker. It is not about predicting the future, it's really about supporting decision make, making under uncertainties, under different assumptions. Okay, perfect. <clears throat> uh, let's go back to the presentation. So I, would, I will stop a bit for a Q&A session and then we can move on with the Excel exercise. So I will take uh, the opportunity also to answer uh, the uh, yeah, Silas question. And then there was also a comment in the chat. So um, we have, uh, like is the, 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 the prosecution of the first question we had. So on what is the appropriate model uh, used in the energy sector? And then uh, a specification on, let's say, uh, in electricity demand. So really, um, uh, it, it's really difficult to answer uh, such a question just because uh, you really have, if you remember when I did the uh, the mentee um, uh, poll, in which I ask you um, which are the important, uh, the key aspects to take into in, to take into into consideration when you develop a new model. Uh, one of them was uh, the the objective, so the model objective. So right now, just reading at these two uh, questions, these two comments, it's really difficult for me to answer because I don't have clear what is the objective. So, for example, you can say, uh, yeah, electricity demand. Uh, clearly, I know what we are talking about, but I don't know if you are talking about, for example, the electricity demand uh, for a building, for a region, uh, for an entire country. Uh, are you thinking about, let's say, the average uh, electricity demand, for example, for uh, over a time period, so for example, per day, per month, per year, or are you talking about, uh, let's say, the uh, actual load profile of, uh, for example, a building over the 24 hours, depending on the resolution? So it's really difficult to, to, to answer this question. But on the other way, um, I don't think, uh, let's say, Let's say if you write me an email, there is no problem. We can also uh, talk in parallel. But the goal of this um, capacity, at least for the first part of this capacity building uh, program, is really to dive into what is modeling in general. So uh, 
what I would say, depending if you want, also you can answer me or you can uh, raise your hand and I can uh, and we can think. Uh, sorry, we can talk uh, and I can give you the floor. Um, the the issue is that the goal here is basically um, to give you the mean to uh, understand what is the modeling exercise that you should be doing in order to answer the the question uh, you've been asked, uh, you're asking yourself, for example, or your institution uh, is asking you to, to provide. So the idea uh, at the beginning would be every, um, every time always to start with, uh, let's say, uh, a simplified model that um, you can build using tools that you already know, for example, Excel. And that's exactly what we will be doing today uh, with the Excel exercise. And I think that if we are talking about electricity demand, you will see that in the exercises we'll be uh, developing during these webinars, you will see uh, in the third, for example, a webinar we will do together, uh, there is the power sector which is involved. So in that phase, I think you will see. But in any case, the approach I will be presenting you to presenting you today, for example, uh, which is focused on the transport, sec the transport sector, uh, is in terms of approach and mathematical approach and modeling approach, an approach that you can uh, replicate also when uh, thinking about, for example, the electricity need for uh, an entire country in the future, for example. Uh, and this, that's the same also in the, in the next lecture we will have, in, we, in which we will try based uh, on the cooling needs, for example, of a country in terms of residential building cooling, uh, what will be in the future the electricity need in order to um, provide the cooling service we, uh, we let's say the country is expected to have in the in the in the future, for example, as you can imagine, two for example drivers for uh, cooling service uh, demand uh, growth could be, for example, one the fact that uh, we are talking about clearly the uh, African continent in which you all know that the temperatures are let's say on average higher than other places in the world. Um, second, we have uh, people uh, having. Um, also their income growing over time. So they have um, purchase power, which is also growing. So they will be able more and more to um, uh, buy appliances, which needs, which are, let's say, energy, um, electricity and energy intensive. So for example, um, fans and uh, um, uh, cooling, uh, cooling infrastructure, cooling appliances. But on the other hand, we also have the climate change impact that we know will be uh, warming the planet and uh, with especially um, peak and extreme weather uh, events that will uh, all the uh, analysts expect to uh, have an impact also on the uh, energy demand and the electricity demand in the cooling sector. So I hope this more or less gives you an answer because actually there is no right answer. If you want to write me uh, also an email in which you said you specify for example, for which institution you work and what are the questions you are trying to 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 to, to answer, uh, we can have a talk on that. I'm 100% free. For example, available. So, for example, if you are trying to model, for example, the electricity demand for a uh, a building for our or a small city, there is there are approaches that you can have. For example, st stochastic sub stochastic approaches, so statistical approaches. But on the other end, if you are thinking about an entire country, the approach are completely different because you can't use, uh, let's say, uh, bottom-up approaches. So it really depends also on the computational uh, power you have. So it's really, really complex. So my, my goal here is to present you the, uh, let's say, the basis on the energy modeling. But as we also anticipated in the uh, introductory uh, lecture, so in the pre-launch, the idea here is really to build also a community. And you have uh, my email, you have the program email. So feel free really to, to write us email and to uh, ask us how we could support you in uh, whatever task you may have uh, on your daily, daily work. So I will move just with the uh, comment I had in the uh, in the chat so from um, innocent musafiri which um, 
which says that the reason, I think this was just after the main team ether poll in which I asked you in which time horizon you are used to do your modeling and projection exercises. Uh, so his comment is, uh, the reason for choosing the short horizon is that you minimize the probability of being misled. Uh, yeah, I understand what you what you say. Uh, clearly, the less the sorry, the shorter the time horizon you're considering, uh, the uh, less the less is the probability of you of you um, let's say um, doing errors in in projections. This is I think we all agree on that. But what I could replicate is the fact that sometimes you actually need to do uh, projections on a very long term. Uh, for example, now we we are working, uh, for example, for the agenda 2030, we have to do um, analysis which goes till 2030, but also till 2040 and 60. For example, we talked about the agenda 2063 from all the African leaders. Um, so there are there are moments uh, there are uh, especially it really depends on what's your job what the institution you work in and what you are asked to do but really there are um, there are uh, moments in which you are asked to do uh, long term projections and even though we know that uh, extending the time period the time horizon you take into in consideration during your modeling exercise uh, you have to do it and you have to uh, take uh, the uh, necessary precautions and measures in order to minimize the error you you may have. So thank you for your um, for your comment because it's really important to take into account the fact that yeah, extending the time really uh, the uncertainty um, uh, I can say increases. For example, if we look at the modeling exercises we did when we published the 2019 Africa Energy Outlook, uh, those results will be really different, for example, for 2021, 2022, because uh, from with respect to what uh, actually happened in the real world, because in 2019, in 2018, when we were doing this exercise, this modeling um, analysis, we didn't know that COVID-19 uh, would have uh, appeared. So you see that even on a very short term, because from 2019, which was the year in which we uh, published the Africa Energy Outlook from to 2020, actually, when the COVID crisis started, just one year passed. And uh, all probably the assumptions of all energy modelers for 2020, 2021, 2021, 2022. And I think we will see, the, we uh, will uh, feel the impact of this crisis also for many years. These assumptions uh, weren't correct because there, were, there was an unprecedented event. So in any case, it's really important to, to, to take into consideration that. But sometimes, even though we know that this, the uncertainty increases, um, we have to do long-term projections for, for many, many reasons. OK, so I will move on. If you have other questions, feel free to put them in the chat to raise your hand. But in the meantime, I will continue. Um, by uh, moving to the Excel exercise. So since we don't have uh, much time and that's not the purpose, let's say, of these, of these two hours, uh, I will just go through the exercise um, and um, showing you a bit what is the, uh, the approach, what is the rationale be behind the, um, the answer of uh, each question you have in the ex exercise. So my suggestion is, try to do uh, this exercise by yourself uh, without looking at the solutions. Um, go and so use the Excel file that is in the Google Drive that I remember uh, you we shared. Um, so try to do that by yourself. If something isn't clear, look at the solutions first in the PDF and then go in the Excel file, which also has the formulas which are already pre-compiled. And then if uh, again, something is not clear, feel free to uh, write me and uh, I will be 100% available in, in helping you understanding or maybe you can find an error that uh, we did. And actually at that point I would correct the, the handbook. So these, two, um, these two, two documents that you have, the Excel file with the exercises and the, um, the handbook. I'm oh, sorry, in this case, I opened the Kenya handbook, but it's exactly the same. Uh, but okay. Um, so this was the first exercise. 
um, I will go up actually. So if you are here, you can see that you can go in the introduction to energy modeling exercises. And you can see that in this section, you just have the um, exercise with the questions. And for each question, you have a small int that we gave you in order to help you. Uh, my suggestion is again, not, don't look at the int before trying to answering it because maybe it will bias your approach. And on the other hand, at the end, you will find modeling exercise solutions. So you go there. So in this case, you are asked, uh, so this exercise asked you to, um, to uh, put yourself, let's say in the shoes of someone working, an official working in the uh, Ministry of Energy uh, of a uh, hypothetical country. Um, which is asked to estimate the future demand for oil products for the transport sector in uh, this country which, that, we, that we will call um, country A. Because this energy ministry, so the um, entity for which this analyst um, is working, analyst and modeler is working, uh, wants to anticipate ref refinery activities, uh, the import of oil products and to plan accordingly a strategy to limit import dependency. So this is really a real case scenario, I would say, especially if we think about uh, the what are the implications for the oil and gas sector uh, with the conflict that we are living here in Europe. Um, so really, really like a really relevant exercise. So if you look at the, um, so I will try to go to jump from the Excel file to the PDF file so that you can see actually. Sorry, just a second. Yeah, my Excel is, is okay, no worries. We'll go to the PDF file which already has everything, I would say. Okay, so you should be able to see the PDF. Um, so if you look at the Excel file, you will see that this is, let's say, the first um, uh, data that you can look at. So you will see that there are columns which are in yellow, which are the columns uh, which are um, marked as historical. So you have um, information from 2000 to so to 2018, um, okay, sorry. Um, in which you can see the oil demand. So these are all historical data. For example, you can gather them interacting with the relevant agencies in your country. So I don't know if you have uh, clearly from the energy ministry, you can, so in the infrastructure ministry, you may have um, statistics uh, agency which are in charge of collecting this kind of data, it really depends on uh, on where you where you work and um, which are the agencies that can have uh, the most um, reliable data on that. But you have information on an annual uh, basis from 2000 to 2018 for this country. So you have oil demand, you have the population, which again comes from those um, surveys and uh, demographic pools I mentioned you. You have the total car stock, you have the kilometer traveled per car, which is uh, an average, again, which maybe can come from the Ministry of Transport, for example. You have the occupancy rate per car, and you have uh, the import of gasoline and the refinery output, which again, can come from the energy ministry, so the uh, Ministry of Infrastructure, or uh, from, for example, transport, so now in this case, yeah, from maybe statistics agency too, or you can contact uh, companies working in the uh, oil and gas sector. So yeah, it depends on, on uh, country specific, uh, so case by case. The only data you have in the future, let's say, are now our, these projections uh, values, which comes from, let's say again, demographic, um, I don't know, the Office for Statistics, which uh, on uh, are used to do projections in the future in order to understand how, for example, the population of a country will evolve uh, in the next years. So I was able to open my Excel file. So I will move to, to the Excel file. Um, so here you can see that we have 
uh, this information. So the first question is calculate the passenger kilometer variable, so which is called PKM over 2018. So this this variable, I'm uh, sorry, uh, maybe I need to uh, give you also some other information, but really, uh, because as I anticipated you, this is really a simplified version of an exercise that you could do being an analyst in the energy ministry, for example, which is in charge of this analysis. But in this case, we will assume that all the oil consumed in the country is gasoline. So we are not taking into account other oil products that, for example, can be um, diesel. Uh, and all the oil consumed in the country is uh, consumed by the transport sector. So in this case, this is again an assumption, but uh, for the sake of the, the simplicity of this exercise this is an assumption that we, we will take into account. Uh, then other assumptions, but no electric cars, uh, no buses, no uh, three wheelers, just individual cars. So we don't have trucks, we don't have buses. Again, this is really a simplified, simplified version. If you want to complicate the exercise, feel free to do it, to ask us, ask me, and we will try to help you how you could uh, define how you could, for example, um, add rows to the Excel file in order to take into account, for example, buses, trucks, et cetera. So the first question is, what is the intensity of the passenger transport activity in the country, which is, is uh, calculated, is defined by the passenger kilometer uh, variable. So here uh, you can see that uh, this, um, can I say this uh, uh, variable is calculated um, through the uh, multiplication of but again, I will try to skip to switch to the Excel file. You will see that this is calculated by the uh, through the multiplication of the total car stock, the kilometer traveled per car, and the occupancy uh, rate per car. Pay attention uh, because in this Excel file we ask you for specific uh, units of measurement. So in this case, for example, you were asked to provide the um, answer in a billion kilometer. So in this case, you have based on the um, un uh, unit of measurements you have above to divide this value by 1000. So to divide by 10 to the power of three. The next question is, uh, sorry. The next question is uh, to calculate the average fuel consumption per car, um, which in this case uh, has to be calculated or, as an average fuel consumption per car, which is in toy per uh, kilometer, but you're also asked to do it in average fuel consumption per uh, 100 kilometer, which in unit of measurement is liters per kilometer. Um, so for in order to calculate that, pay attention that right now we are just talking about historical data. So we are just doing the analysis for past. So we are looking at the past in order then to uh, anticipate the future. So in this case, we have uh, the multiplication between, um, so D6, so it, which is the oil demand and uh, the kilometer per uh, kilometer traveled per car. And we uh, multiply also that by the total car stock, taking into account again, uh, issues with the uh, units of measurement. And again, units of measurement when you move to TOE per kilometers, to uh, liters per 100 kilometers. Question three, calculate the total stock of cars over this trend, uh, this period 2019, 2030. So here we are thinking, we are starting to look into, to anticipate the future. And in order to do that, we have, um, like the question asks us to uh, use specific assumptions. So, we are said, we are told, and these are information that can come from different, again, assumptions, uh, reasoning, et cetera. But in this case, we know that, or we anticipate the rate of additional, um, uh, sorry, uh, the, the kilometers traveled per car are increasing five, uh, 50 kilometers per year. So it means that uh, people in this country that could be, for example, Rwanda, uh, Rwanda citizens are more and more uh, traveling because every year on an average, each car is traveling 50 kilometers more. So this, for example, 
uh, you can have this value because maybe we already have the historical data and we have seen that during these 10, uh, 18 years we have from 2000 to uh, 2018, we can already see that that was actually the growth. So we see that for this country, um, every year, the, the historical value increased by 50 kilometers per, per year. We, also, we are also told that the occupancy rate remains constant. So we have on average 1.5 people, uh, people per car. And the PKM, which I remember, you remind you is the passenger kilometer variable is increasing at a 7% per year uh, rate from 2018 to 2030, which again comes from uh, data uh, from the historical data. So the total car stock can be calculated uh, by multiplying all these values. Uh, so the three values that we calculated and take into account the uh, unit of measurement. So right now we have these values and moving, let's say the calculation till uh, 2030, we can see how this value is actually increasing. Um, so the total car stock is actually increasing. Here you have 0 0.70, um, so sorry, 0 0.7, 103 million cars. So it's almost uh, a billion car. I'm oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. It's almost a million car, my bad. Um, question four, calculate the oil demand over the 2019-2030 period if the average consumption per car improves at a 1% per year um, in terms of uh, average fuel consumption per car. So in this case, it's a bit different uh, with respect to the, the previous question, because in this case, we are told that the efficiency of the cars is improving, which means that uh, the car, the average car is using less, um, less, less fuel in order to do, for example, one kilometer. So here you can see from the formula that we are decreasing this value because we are multiplying the, pre the previous year value by uh, one minus 1%, so 99%. So every, every year, as you can see here, um, we are decreasing the, um, the consumption, the total oil demand because the average, so we have the average fuel, um, let's say for, uh, consumption per car, which is um, decreasing. But on the other end, we have uh, the number, the total number of, number of car, which is increasing. So we have one car, which is using less uh, fuel, but we have the total stock, the total car stock, which is increasing a lot. So we will see with these two opposite trends, which of, of them is winning. You can already imagine since the efficiency is increased just by 1% that probably this car stock, which is increasing. Uh, so we have both the car, the car stock, which is increasing and also the number of kilometers we each car does. Probably at the end, uh, we can expect the total fuel uh, to, increase, um, to increase over the, the years. So the next step, once we have calculated the total oil demand, which uh, I remind you is calculated as uh, the multiplication between the average fuel consumption per car, the total car stock and the kilometer travel per each car. Uh, again, take into account the different units of measurement. This is really important. We can calculate uh, the, um, to, we can answer the next question, the fifth question, which is assuming that the, the refinery output increases at 2% per year, calculate the imports of gasoline needed to meet the gasoline demand. So here you had um, a new assumption that, you, uh, that the refinery output increases at 2% per year. So we are told, for example, by the energy ministry or interacting with the oil and gas company, which tell us, uh, yeah, our strategic plans for the next 12 years, for example, are increasing at the 2% um, rate per year, our refinery output. So the amount of oil, which is um, actually produced, uh, so uh, uh, produced in the country. So you take that as an input and then uh, you calculate it, you calculate the growth in terms of um, refinery output. So here you can see this is the value, the historical value. We can see that from 2019, the value is calculated multiplying by one plus 2%. So one plus 0 0.02, the uh, value 
of the previous year. So this means that we have, as I anticipated before, the total oil demand, which is growing, and also the refinery output is growing. So the idea now, sorry, this is the refinery output. So the question asks us, how much will uh, be imported each year in terms of gasoline? Because we can already see that the refinery output isn't enough to satisfy the uh, total oil demand of this country. So we can see, for example, that in this year, we, we uh, our refineries produce 80, sorry, 18 kilo TOE, but the total oil demand is 38. So we are forced to import uh, 20 uh, kilo TOE from uh, external from the, the, the external providers. And we can see that if till 2030, we do the calculation, we do the math, so we subtract from the total oil demand estimated based on our assumption and the uh, refinery output based again on our assumption, so from information we, we get from uh, relevant stakeholders, we can see that also uh, the import of gasoline is increasing. So we move to uh, from 20 uh, kilo TOE in, 20, in 2000, sorry, to 242 kilo TOE needed in 2030. So this is uh, a huge increase from 20 to 242 in just 30 years. But also just looking at from today, let's say in 2019, when this exercise was, um, was defined, was uh, yeah, created, we moved from 92 to 242, which is uh, more than two times the, the current, let's say the current uh, demand in terms of oil. So here you can, uh, you are, as last question, you are just asked to calculate very sim simple parameter, but which is really important, which is the import dependency, where in, in the import dependency is uh, defined as the ratio between how much you import and what, how much you consume. So in this case, is the uh, ratio between the import of gasoline over total oil demand. So we can see that the, uh, the import dependency was uh, almost constant during uh, all from 2000 to uh, 2018. So, and it was at 53%. And this means that um, like both the refinery output and also the demand were growing at uh, comparable rates, but we can see that from 2019, um, there is a rapid shift and that's not the case anymore. So we have uh, the import which is growing. And for example, we anticipate that in 2030, this country will be 70% uh, dependent on import uh, when we talk about the um, uh, oil import in this case. So then, as you told me, you all work with Excel basically, so I don't think I will be uh, showing you uh, something new, but you can clearly plot all these, um, these uh, data we, we calculated. So the result of our modeling exercises, uh, and you can see how changing, for example, the input parameters here. So here, for example, we put the refinery output capable of increasing their, um, sorry, the refineries capable of increasing their output at a 3%, for example, rate, how this will change the, um, the, uh, the import dependency and also clear, so the import of gasoline needed from uh, other countries and other providers and the uh, lowering the import dependency. So this is more or less uh, the idea with this, this exercise. If you have questions, feel free to raise your hand and put, uh, uh, or write them in the chat. We stop sharing for the moment. Okay. I hope everything was clear. Again, as I told you, uh, the idea was to go through this exercise uh, and to see um, the, the, the approach we have when dealing with such a, an issue that, sorry, such a, a problem. For example, uh, someone, uh, a decision maker, which asks us, um, how the future of our country looks like uh, when talking about imports of oil. And as I, as I anticipated you, and you can actually, uh, I think you can relate with the situation we are living right now with the oil and gas sector. Uh, this is a really important exercise. So I invite you to try to do this exercise by, exercise by yourself. And 
um, so look at the PDF, so the handbook, the Excel file. And if you have doubt, feel free to, to read it, to, to write me, and we can see together uh, how to solve actually or yeah, to, to address the, this issue. Okay. Okay, so I don't see any any um, raised hand. So I would close here the lecture and uh, I wish you a pleasant day and we see each other at the next uh, lecture. Thank you very much. Bye.